So the rookie, that's me, draws the short straw and gets handed Hebrews chapter 2. Have any of you read or listened to Hebrews 2 before today? I have been toiling over it for two weeks and considered saying pass on Hebrews 2 and just running to the gospel lesson in Mark. But I do like a challenge most days, and I wanted to decipher Hebrews 2 or die trying. I decided on a title for today's sermon before I had any real idea of where I was going to go with the message. I landed on, for this reason, a term that seems to be exclusive to the NIV, the New International Version of the Bible. I went with that because I thought finding out the reason might be a fun adventure. For this reason is a nice-sounding biblical statement. A dad probably wouldn't say, for this reason to his child. I don't think a mother would either. We'd likely simplify it by just saying, this is why. The term for this reason appears in three of the four passages in my NIV Bible that we're going to be talking about today. In Genesis, it says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother. In Hebrews, it says, for this reason, Jesus had to be made like his brothers and sisters in every way. And in Mark, like Genesis, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. Our psalm passage tells us that that reason includes blessings, fruitfulness, and prosperity of all kinds for those who fear the Lord and walk in His ways. That sounds easy. Well, within our Scripture readings today, we have something old and familiar. That's our Genesis text, which is the foundation of our faith. We have something that seems very puzzling, at least puzzling to me, and that's our Hebrews text. But we need to seek wisdom from God on how to understand that. And we have a difficult lesson that not many want to talk about from the front of the church, or from anywhere else for that matter, and that comes to us from Mark. I'm going to address all three because... I believe we need to hang on to the old, we need to understand the puzzling, and I think it's healthy to address the difficult. The difficult today being the big D word, divorce. Please know, I don't bring up the topic of divorce to condemn anyone. I'm going to address it because the effects of divorce touch everyone. Those effects go way beyond just the couple. I'll explain as we go. And again, please know, I share this not to beat on anyone, but perhaps to strengthen us all. That's what Scripture and preaching are supposed to do. So there's the disclaimer. Now let's go to Genesis. God creates Adam from the dust of the ground. He also creates all the beasts and the birds the same way, formed out of the ground. But He gave most of us a sliver more of intelligence than he did the birds, the bees, and the beasts. And God gives Adam one very important instruction about living in the garden. You all know it. God tells him, Adam, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's it. One man, one law. So simple, anyone could ace that test. You have the whole garden to keep yourself busy, Adam. You have enough food to eat, and you have an unblemished, perfect world to live in. Just be grateful. Now go name the birds and the animals and kick back in bachelor heaven here on earth. But no. God realized that the man he made should not be alone. So he puts Adam to sleep, cuts Adam open on his side, and removes an unnecessary rib from his cage. He sutures him back up and makes a woman from this rib. This is one of the great mysteries of the Bible. It is so hard to understand, yet we are all called to trust and believe that God's Word is true. This isn't the only passage that will test your faith. May I remind you of Noah and the ark, Jonah and the big fish, Daniel and the lions, And then there's this other one that's kind of key, Jesus and the empty tomb. 
Our God is the God of the remarkable. Yahweh is the God of faith, not always the God of easy answers. So then Adam makes this statement, perhaps to himself, perhaps to God, or maybe to this new woman who is formed from his rib, and he says, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And then we get to our first for this reason. For this reason, to fulfill God's will for mankind, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. What an odd statement to have included in the book of Genesis. Adam wasn't conceived. He didn't spend any time in a womb, and he certainly wasn't born of a woman. So for what reason is Adam speaking about leaving a father and mother of which he never had? It's simply a foretaste of what's in store for humanity. For this reason, Adam and his wife become one flesh. The first perfect marriage. No hunger, no shopping for clothes, no fighting, and no shame. What could go wrong? Well, enter Satan, and along with Satan, sin. For this reason, Adam and his wife became one flesh, so he would protect his wife. He failed at that pretty significantly. Think snake and apple. For this reason, Adam and his wife became one flesh to become a family and to set the stage for the future of mankind. Adam takes Eve as his wife. They have at least two perfect children, and they live happily ever after. Oh, what a great story. It's not how it went down. Paradise in the garden, paradise on earth, only lasted for two chapters. As imperfect as Adam and Eve were, the reason two became one was to form a family, the bedrock of society. Okay, hang on to that while we move toward the end of the Bible to the book of Hebrews. I missed text study this week since I was working out of town, but oh, how I would have loved to hear the conversation or maybe the silence that filled the room after reading Hebrews chapter 2. I've read this passage a dozen times in the last couple of weeks, and during some read-throughs, I actually convinced myself that I understand what's happening. Then I read it again, and I think that I'm reading it in Greek. At times, it seems very foreign to me, but I do like the way it starts. Chapter 2 begins. Pay attention to the word you've heard so you don't drift away. If you think angels can send an important message, wait until you hear what the Son of God has to say. God is explaining the hierarchy of heaven. If the message of the angels, the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments, which the angels brought to Moses, if you think that message of the law matters, and it does, what will happen if we ignore the gospel, the salvation of our Lord Jesus Christ? The gospel exceeds the law in importance, but we have no need for the gospel if there is no law. The gospel we claim for our salvation was announced by Jesus. It was confirmed by the apostles, and it was testified to by God and the Holy Spirit. There's the Trinity plus one, the plus one being the group of men called the apostles. Verse 8 says, Everything has been placed under human authority. Everything except death. We can prolong death, but we can't, we can't solve it. Verse 9 says, Jesus was crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death. I don't think of glory and honor when I think of death, but Jesus turns that all around. So I want to keep this as simple as possible. You may never read Hebrews chapter 2 again in your life. I hope you do, though. Just try to think of it this way the next time you read it. Hebrews 2 as an, is an intense and very descriptive way of explaining John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The world that we live in was in our control at the beginning. Adam was made from it. He named all the critters, and he was in charge until sin changed everything. Even the law of Moses, God's laws, could not clean us up enough. 
So God sent Jesus as a man into the same world we're living in right now. So we can be on the team that defeats death. I want to be on that team. Pick me. God made Jesus a little lower than the angels for a time. So he could experience everything we experience. Birth, life, hunger, thirst, temptation, pain, and death. He was sent so he might experience death for everyone and destroy the devil who holds the power of death. For this reason, Jesus had to be made like his brothers and sisters, that's us, to pay the price for the sins of those same brothers and sisters. God sent him for this reason. We are that reason. Billions of seemingly insignificant lives over thousands of years, and he came for every one of them. Some paid attention to the word they heard. Some did not. Some drifted away and only beheld the glory of Christ for a moment before they were banished from heaven. Pay attention to the word you heard, the word you hear. Don't drift from Jesus. Thank you for sticking with me on that. Now to the Gospel. Mark 10, verses 2 through 12. Some Pharisees came and tested Jesus by asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Jesus replied, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. Jesus says, It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. When they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this, and he answered, Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. Pharisees are always trying to trick a guy. They ask Jesus, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Dumb question, Pharisees. They know the laws better than anyone else. They just want to trip up this itinerant preacher. So Jesus asks a question back to them. Well, what did Moses say? And they say, well, he says that it's permitted. Why do the Pharisees care? They don't. They just want Jesus to suffer the same fate as John the Baptist, who was beheaded for telling Herod he broke the law by marrying his brother Philip's wife. It's never about right and wrong with these guys. It's always about removing Jesus and keeping their precious but fleeting power. But of course, Jesus doesn't fall for it. Instead, he goes back to where we started today in Genesis 2. The Old Testament matters. Jesus quotes it all the time. We go back to Genesis 2, the book of the Law of Moses. At the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. Then the two shall become one flesh. Jesus goes on to explain that they are no longer two, but one. What God has joined together, no man shall separate. Nice sentiment, Jesus. But there's been plenty of separating going on since long before you appeared on the scene. So if the two really become one, there's a lot of surgical separation happening in the world. In the United States, 50% of all marriages end in divorce. Our odds would be better if we just flipped a coin. Now remember what I said about the Pharisees' precious but fleeting power. Isn't that the real reason that half of all marriages in the U.S. end in divorce? Precious but fleeting power. Well, he has power over me, and I don't like it one bit. She has power over me, and I won't stand for it. Wikipedia. Make fun of it all you want, but there is some useful information there. Wikipedia includes three words in its definition of divorce. Those three words are 
dissolving the bonds, B-O-N-D-S, dissolving the bonds. That got me thinking, if God's bonds of marriage are so strong that two become one, how is it even possible for those bonds to dissolve? They're from God. Well, it's through that precious but fleeting power that we think we have, and maybe our lack of commitment. Check out the titles of these books that popped up when I googled divorce. How to Survive Divorce. Divorce is the Worst. 50 Ways to Flourish After Divorce. The Truth About Children and Divorce. The Truth About Children and Divorce. And this one might knock you over like it did me. How to Make Divorce Fun. Yeah, it is an actual book that was published by an actual publishing company. My mom and dad divorced shortly after my 18th birthday. I drove my mom to her new apartment here in Brandon the morning after the last full day she spent at our house in the early spring of 1983. I completely understood why she filed and why she left. But I had no idea how long it would bother me afterward. 38 years later, I still reel over the effects of that decision. My heartbroken dad, who couldn't or wouldn't crawl outside of himself and what he perceived as precious but fleeting power, he found himself unable to treat his wife of 27 years any better than he did. And my mom, certainly no saint, admits her own failing within that union. She felt, however, forced to make that drastic move for her own survival. Both were responsible. Both allowed the active agent of this world, Satan, to begin dissolving the bonds of that marriage more than 20 years before those bonds broke. If you've experienced divorce, or if, you've, or if someone you love has gone through or is going through divorce, I will tell you the same thing I tell my mom. The powerful bonding agent named Jesus Christ has accepted your pain. He feels and takes on your sorrow, and he has lifted you up and set you on solid ground to begin anew. In divorce as in all matters of brokenness. Repentance is the key to healing. Whether you were at fault or not, Psalm 51 tells us, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Jesus forgives. Jesus works from where you are today. You don't have to tidy yourself up first. Every hardship in life either makes us or it breaks us. Hardship either makes us lean on the precious power of Jesus Christ, whose power is not fleeting, or that hardship will toss us to the ground, trying to convince us that we have to lift ourselves up. God sent Jesus to this earth for this reason, to save us from sin because we are incapable of saving ourselves. There isn't enough money to purchase salvation. There isn't enough pluck or courage that you can muster for yourselves outside of the power of Jesus Christ. And sadly, it seems as though our society is working harder and harder to dissolve the bonds between us and him. But we know, those of us who've heard the word and refuse to drift away, we know whose we are. We are his, not because of anything we've done, but because of everything He's done. And for this reason, we believe. Amen.